So, some good timing for this conversation. Perfect, right? So, before we get into the deal and maybe Comcast and what's going to happen with Hulu, let's talk about your NFL sure. deal you just struck. Because you're paying a lot of money, $3.3 billion, making a five-year So it's commitment. been reported. So report, I, my sources tell me $3.3 billion. And that's about a 30% premium per game over what the rights holders for this past season held. Are you overpaying? Um, I don't think so. I think any time you go to an auction, um, somebody wins, and everybody who loses says that the winner overpaid. Um, and I think that's been the case for 20 years at Fox. We, first of all, we overpaid in 1993 to take the NFL from CBS, um, and we've been overpaying ever since. But something different is happening this time. Ratings for the Thursday night games, I believe, were down 12% this past season. Overall ratings the year before, down another 10%. So you have two seasons, two years, of roughly 10% declines, sure. and you're paying 30% more? How does that make sense? I think because you either have the most watched content on television, or you don't have it. And I think if you look at our relationship with the NFL, going back to 1993, the Fox Broadcast Network has really built so much value for Fox. So News Corp was worth about $9 billion in 1993. And the Broadcast Network helped launch every other channel we have, the regional sports networks, the National Geographic channels, Fox News, um, the FX channels. So, so much value was built on the back of the broadcast network. And the broadcast network was really built on the NFL and on our relationship with the NFL. So it's a long deal. It's a five-year deal. Um, and in looking at that, we have an opportunity to build businesses um, on that, you know, rather than just looking at it from you know, the 11 games that we'll have on a Thursday night. And last, the last two times, you know, we were not an aggressive bidder because the deals were so short. So building businesses, specifically, you're talking about creating a direct-to-consumer app for Fox, similar to what CBS does? I think it gives us the opportunity to do that. So we haven't made a decision to do that, and that will really be a decision at New Fox. But Fox now has the opportunity to do that. It has the opportunity to do a direct-to-consumer business. It has the opportunity to take our rights in a much more broad digital way than we did before, both the Thursday nights and the Sunday nights um, package. If we want to take it direct to consumer, if we want to wholesale it or retail it um, to other players, you know, we can now do that. And the rights we had before were really, there was too much Swiss cheese in it. You know, there were too many holes in the rights, and now we have a complete set of rights across Thursday and Sunday. So what are the odds that New Fox creates a direct-to-consumer service now that you have these NFL rights? I think over a longer period of time, it's certainly something that New Fox is going to look at. Um, New Fox will be a very nimble company. It'll be a broadcasting company and Fox News. You know, that's a different company than 21st Century Fox, which is a very broad company. There are you know, they're very reliant upon, or we are very reliant upon the bundle and the bundle of channels, you know, that we present to, um, to distributors. So if ratings go down another 10% every consecutive year, will this deal have been a mistake over the five years? I mean, it's a long commitment. Who, who knows what TV is going to look like in five years? We could speculate about a lot of things. I don't believe that will happen, and I think that this is going to prove to be a really good deal for Fox. Um, okay, so the deal. Which company are you going to? Um, they're going to be two amazing companies. So Disney will be the biggest, most creative, most powerful company that Hollywood ever had. Um, so that's a very exciting company. And New Fox, I think, will be more, it'll be a very cash-rich company, it'll be a very focused company. And I think it'll be a more disruptive company than people believe. Um, so I think there'll be exciting things to do there. And the deal is, you know, eight weeks since it was announced, and I don't know yet. Speaking of which, there have been rumblings, reports that Comcast, CNBC's parent company, um, is interested in going in at a higher price, um, and there's been a lot of talk about what's going to happen when sort of the tick-tock of how much more Comcast bid initially comes sure. out. What's going to happen? Well, we could have a speculation palooza. Um, I you can, definitely know I more can than talk I for Fox. Was, yeah. I can't talk for Disney, and I can't talk for, for Comcast. Um, we struck a deal that we thought was really good for the Fox shareholders. 
um, and we're excited about it, and we think the mix of assets that are going to Disney um, will make for a very, very powerful company, and we think that the assets that are staying at New Fox are going to make for a really exciting New Fox. Comcast obviously thinks that those assets would also be a good fit for, for it, helping it expand internationally. Obviously, there's a lot of synergy with the Universal Parks. Which company would benefit more from having your assets? I, I'm obviously biased, but I love the assets that we have at Fox. Um, and I think the breadth of the assets um, are really attractive and they're really unique. You know, I think if you look at the various companies, you know, I think FX is a really unique company. It's the you know, most creative, you know, most celebrated ad-supported um, cable network. A brand like National Geographic is... There's no doubt that people want these sure. assets, that these are valuable assets. Obviously, Disney wants them, as does Comcast, or as did Comcast. They'll make, they're going to make Disney a much more you know, powerful company, and they would make Comcast a much more powerful company. But they would make any company that bought them that wanted to be in the media space you know, more powerful. But do you think they're a more natural fit for a, a Comcast when you look at FX and, and your different cable channels? Do you think that's a more natural fit for Comcast, or do you think a better one for Disney? I think it's a great fit for Disney. Um, so I guess I'll go with Disney on that question. And what, <laughs> and what if about... If I have to answer, if I can't sure. avoid it okay. anymore, I'll go with Disney. Um, what about James Murdoch? What's his role going to be at the new company? That'll be up to James. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe up to Bob Iger. Uh, I think it'll be up to James. So he gets... I think he'll be the, the captain of his own ship. Um, in terms of what his role is or which company? Well, I think what James wants to do. You know, I work for James. I've worked for James for many years. He's a fantastic media executive. And I think he'll get to choose what he wants to do. COO? Oh, I don't know. Oh. <laughs> OK, well, we can keep on. I'm not hiring that. Those, those roles. Um, so, um, but it sounds like you'd be excited to be at, at either company, or would you rather? I think they'll both be fantastic companies, so yeah. What about this concept of sort of the culture clash? You know, Fox is known for the Simpsons and a little bit edgier. Oh. You know, the, the version at Disney of the Simpsons is Mickey Mouse. So is there going to be a culture clash? Are your, are your creative people like Ryan Murphy concerned? I think there'll be a broadening of the culture. I think that, you know, Bob's talked about wanting, you know, the three rationales. He talked to you in an interview last week, and he said the three reasons that he was doing the deal was to expand the amount of production, to you know, fuel the direct consumer products, both with quality content and brands, um, and to expand globally. So I think um, you know, fundamentally, Disney's a creative company. It was the only one of two studios that was you know, created by an artist. Um, the other one was United Artists. It's the only one that's never been sold. You know, so I think it's fundamentally a creative company. I think Bob is fundamentally a creative executive. I think he's welcomed you know, Pixar and Marvel and Lucasfilm into Disney. I think he intends to welcome Fox into Disney. And I think it would be a great place for our creators who are really unique and idiosyncratic. And we encourage them to take risks. You know, I think he'll um, welcome them into Disney. Um, that's, that's good news for, if, for those creators, I guess. So um, looking at Hulu, which you are on the board of sure. separately, and obviously whoever ends up buying Fox at this point is Disney is going to have a controlling stake in Hulu. What's next for Hulu? And what does it need to do to really compete with Netflix, which is what Bob Iger has said he really wants? Sure. Um, well, by the time the deal closes, I think Hulu will have in excess of 20 million subscribers. And now, as, as of last report, it has 17. It has 17. And I think it's great. It's been on a tear. The last two quarters, it's added more subscribers in the US than Netflix has, both the last two quarters. It's adding a lot of subscribers. It has the fastest growing of the new you know, digital cable um, packages. Um, so I think it's, it's in a really good place. I think it um, obviously hasn't expanded internationally. I think if you look at the size of the, the world and the billions of households, um, I don't think in either area Netflix has that big of an advantage. I think 20 million homes to 50 million homes you know, isn't that big of an advantage. And I think that you know, in a world of you know, billions of households, you know, National Geographic has 450 million subscribers you know, to the National Geographic channel worldwide. I don't think having 50 million subscribers in 50 countries is really that big an advantage. So I think that Hulu's very well positioned. 
And I think it really will ultimately be about the content. But what about the billions that are being spent on content? There were some headlines last week about how much money is being poured into Hulu and what's going to happen once the new majority owner um, takes charge. I mean, if you look at the billions that are being spent on content at Netflix um, and at Amazon, sure. is Hulu going to ramp it up to those levels? Well, I love how this gets reported. So Netflix, which is a great company, I'm a subscriber, you know, um, you know, it's often reported they're going to spend $8 billion in con on content as though this is some sort of monopolistic amount of money. You know, Fox last year, or well, this year, will spend $12 billion on programming. Um, I imagine Disney, and that's not with no movies, so there's other billions of dollars of movies on top of that. Um, Disney probably will spend $15 billion on programming. So I think on a, if you look at the expanse of Hollywood, Maybe Netflix is spending 10% you know, of the entire content spend of Hollywood. You know, that's not a monopoly amount of it's money. It's not a monopoly, but there's no doubt that it's changing the ecosystem. I mean, even if you look at the addition of, you know, you have now Amazon and Netflix, and some of these companies are bidding not just on trying to find the next Game of Thrones, but also bidding on sports rights sure, but and there pushing was always, up prices. There was always competition. Yeah, but they're, great. they're new, deep-pocketed folks sure. bidding on rights, which are in, have sort of limited supply. But they're deep-pocketed in a way, you know, if you look at the new Disney company, so the new Disney company will make about $20 billion a year in EBITDA, and Netflix is losing 3 to $4 billion in, you know, cash a year. And it's valued That's, differently. And it's valued yeah. on a different metric. So I think to say that one is more, you know, has deeper pockets than the other, Disney has the deeper pockets than Netflix. You know, the capital structure and the way that um, Wall Street is valuing the companies right now is, is on a very, very different metric. You know, Fox will make as much free cash flow next year as, Disney will, as Netflix will lose, mm -hmm. and yet Netflix is worth $120 billion. Hulu has 20 million subscribers, you know, um, what should it be valued at if Netflix is valued at $120 billion? So I, we're not going to go into whether or not media and, and internet companies should be valued differently, because that's a whole sure. different conversation. Um, but it, I think there is this question of how you believe Hulu should be playing this next chapter. Um, who, what, what should the Disney version of Hulu, Disney-owned Hulu, Disney-controlled Hulu look like? I think Different than it does now? Look, I think Disney has, you know, a combined Fox and Disney has a level of quality and branding, you know, so Lucasfilm, Pixar, Disney, Marvel, you know, Black Panther is, according to all the tracking, going to be like one of the biggest openings in history um, this week. Um, the Simpsons, Family Guy, Bob's Burgers, you know, the, the adult animation that we have at Fox, you know, is a very unique asset. Um, it's certainly the most viewed content on um, Hulu, and it was the most viewed content on Netflix as well. So I think there are you know, really deep creative assets that the Disney company will have that, if it chooses to, can flow through Netflix. And I think that already there are certain or things... Or do you mean flow through Hulu? I'm sorry, you're right. <laughs> Thank you Breaking for catching news. me on that. Breaking news, yeah. yeah. Um, if you look at the amount of content, mm -hmm. you know, Hulu has 75,000 episodes of television. Um, Netflix has 40,000 episodes of television. Um, Amazon has about 20,000 episodes of television. So there's, I, I think Hulu's in a very good position, and I think it's growing very quickly, and I think there's going to be a tremendous amount of investment. How much of that growth is going to the new over-the-top uh, digital bundle, um, the TV alternative? It's growing faster than any of the others, and they're all growing very quickly. Lachlan said um, that we have 4 million subscribers at the end of last quarter. Um, I think the number's probably closer to 5 million already. You know, for the OTT? Yeah, it's growing. For the bundle? For the bundle. It's growing really, really quickly. All of the Fox channels are in it. Um, for the last quarter, it essentially um, wiped out any cord cutting for us. You know, we, we reported you know, really fantastic affiliate numbers driven by OTT. Um, we're in all of them. People love them. They love the navigation. So in aggregate, choice. or did the Hulu piece compensate for no, traditional? No, no, in, a, in, in aggregate. aggregate. 
And uh, how concerned are you about cord cutting? Do you think that growth, that, that compensation is going to continue? I was, I, you know, a year ago, I was really concerned about it. Um, and we were hoping, so we were living in this world of hope, and we all know what that's like, um, that the OTT would, would um, take off quickly. And we've been shocked at how quickly it's taken off. And I think if you look at the, if you compared it to satellite, so people are like, oh, it's just a few million subscribers. You know, if you compare it to how quickly satellite grew or, um, or fiber, I mean, to have five, we, 18 months ago, we had zero over the top. You know, and you're saying now it's four million in aggregate. A portion of that is Hulu. It's not four million Hulu. OTT. Four million in aggregate. in aggregate. So four million yeah. between DirecTV Now, Got Sling. It. And Hulu is the Hulu, fastest growing. Hulu in the last couple of quarters for Fox, you know, was the fastest growing. And is that is are, is Hulu and the other OTT products purely cannibalistic? Um, I don't think we know yet. And how much? I think what we what we've looked at is. No, I think the majority of it is not cannibalistic. Now, some of them are cord cutters who are coming back. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are cord nevers. Um, and some of them are people who are changing down for convenience and for price. They're cheaper. And do you think that, and this is a question I asked Bob Iger last week, so I'm going to ask, try to be careful about how I ask this. Are you concerned that the decline in regular TV subscribers, the cord cutting, is not going to be compensated for by growth in these other services? A year from now, two years from now, are you just going to be giving people cheaper options so they trade down? But they're not cheaper to us. So you earn as much per subscriber, yes. and every one of your TV channels is included. Yes. So you're fine either yes. way. Um, shifting over to New Fox, what is New Fox going to look like? Well, and who's going to run it? I only, know, I only know the most um, basic thing, so I don't know who's going to run it. Probably Lachlan, um, right? Probably Lachlan. Um, it's going to be, I, I know what it's structurally going to be. It's going to be a broadcast network with really powerful sports. It's going to have the NFL, the Super Bowl, the World Series, the World Cup, the Daytona 500. Um, so it's going to have really powerful sports. It's going to have um, a great entertainment set of entertainment assets. Um, the broadcast network's had a really good year so far. We're number two for the year. We're number one um, in January. We had four of the five new dramas are on Fox. Two of the top three new comedies are on Fox. So um, we've had a very good creative year. And that's a very powerful platform. That's a platform that is in 120 million homes. There's you know, really no other platform that is but like But pretty that. unusual to split up the, the studio and the network. Yes. What's that going to look like? And what's that going to mean? Is, is the new Fox it's gonna be, network? It's going to be really different. You know, because a couple of years ago, we put together the studio mm -hmm. and the network. We had a very well-run, powerful um, studio. And we put it together with the network so that it would, it would take more of the content from, from the studio. I think um, if you step back for a minute, it's going to give the studio a lot of flexibility. And I talked before about it being disruptive. Mm -hmm. I think of how it finds content. And it can be very open in almost the way, you know, back to the future, going back to the 80s before they changed the laws when networks were not allowed to own content. Um, and therefore, the person who runs the network is going to be really focused on what's the best show for my network. So my network has 40% of the NFL ratings. You know, how do I find content that is appropriate, is matches with that audience? But do you think they'll end up building their own studio? I think in some fashion. I mean, CBS built their own studio after they split from mm -hmm. Paramount. Um, I think it can be nimbler than that. I don't think they have to build a studio. I think they, they may build a studio. But anyone who comes to that platform saying, I'd, I'd like you to take the, the show, I think it's going to be willing to give up ownership and give up a portion of ownership. And I think that's happening already. CBS does that a lot. You know, we've, done, we've done that, and we've mixed and matched with ABC and NBC, where we sort of split things with mm -hmm. them. So I think the independents will be, oh, I know, are very excited about it. So Warner Brothers and Sony and Lionsgate. Um, the, agent, the talent agencies who've been trying to get into the production business and have been sort of shut out by all of the networks. I think they're very excited about the idea that this platform um, is, is going to be much more open to business. Interesting. Um, before we open up to questions, I want to ask you about corporate culture. Sure. Now, you don't oversee Fox News. I do not. Um, so you were not embroiled in those sexual harassment issues. 
But Fox has had its sexual misconduct um, issues, as has pretty much every sure. place in, in the media industry. Um, how do you deal with them? And is this, what's next in, in, in dealing with this, this new era where hopefully sexual misconduct and sexual harassment won't be permitted? Sure. Um, look, I think we're in a watershed moment, and I think every business is having to deal with this, and I think that's a good thing. I think people are coming forward. I think that there's less fear of um, recrimination and reprisal, um, and I think we deal with it in the way that we encourage people to come and talk to us. We investigate. We try and have a very open culture about it, and I think both for you know, sexual harassment and also for, um, for gender discrimination in general. I think this is a very important moment, and I think the people who are coming forward are very brave. I think the journalists um, who are investigating and breaking stories are helping the culture, and I think it's going to be better for us as businesses if we reflect the culture and the society that we live in. And I think that means, you know, in all manner of diversity, that our workforces, you know, should reflect who we're serving. There seem to be some pretty embedded issues at Fox News, both in terms of, of pay and also discrimination and harassment. Did, even though those weren't part of your business, being part of the same parent company, did those leak over or infect what was going on in your businesses? I think it was, um, like I think we're seeing it across so many businesses. I mean, it's, um, it's something that's coming to the fore in Silicon Valley, in mm -hmm. Washington, in other media companies, at NBC. Um, you know, so I think it's something that's been a sort of a wake-up call for companies in how they address these issues. And so and what I are you that's doing a good now? Thing. Well, have I you think made we're, changes? We're trying to be much more open. We're trying to encourage people to come forward. I think the issues we've had, we've tried to be very transparent and vocal about it um, so that we, people understand how we're dealing with it. And therefore, they see how we're dealing with it. And I think you know, actions speak louder than words. And I think James and Lachlan took a very strong position on how we dealt with things at Fox News. Um, issues that we've had at Fox, we've tried to be very transparent about how we've dealt with that. And I think people see that and they're encouraged to say, oh, if I've had an issue in the workplace, I feel that I can come forward and I feel that there aren't, there aren't reprisals and that it will change. Do you feel like there's more work still to be done? I think there's always more work to be done. I think the, the social issues that exist in workplaces, you know, are, um, I, I, I think they will always be evolving. Um, let's open up to some questions. I'm sure there will be many. Here we go. My name is Alex Trugloff. Uh, I worked at your org at Fox Searchlight 100 years ago, and then we did some business together oh, sure. at Hulu for many years, uh, buying TV from you. And uh, um, there's an argument to be made that over the last 20, 30 years, film has kind of lost its uh, its majority prominence in pop culture have been replaced by TV. John Langraff, who works for you, has spent a lot of time talking about uh, whether it's in fact sort of a, a peak time for TV. And you're still a young executive, so if you think about um, the coming decade or decades, uh, do you think TV will decline in its relevant prominence in, 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 in popular culture? And do you think something else might come in the entertainment world uh, to supplant it and eventually you know, move TV into uh, into a lesser prominence, and uh, any ideas as to what it might be? Okay. Um, I guess my, if I went right to the last question, I think that mobile will become a more important format for storytelling. But fundamentally, it's all about storytelling. And human beings love to tell each other stories, and some of us are better at it than others. And so the very best storytellers in the world choose to come to Hollywood. And they have for 100 years. And they, they come here and they tell the stories. And they work with each other. So the best writers work with the best directors and actors and makeup artists. So I think technology is changing sort of formats. But I don't think it changes the, the fundamental idea of how of the people want stories to be told. So technology said you had to go and see, you know, to a cinema to see a, a, a movie. And Art came from that. And I think television you know, was a different format that came into your house, and art came from that. When it, when it moved to an on-demand world, television could tell different stories. 
So one of um, so a movie, a TV show can now really be a 70-hour movie, you know, because you can tell one story, um, and people love that um, connection to characters. And I think TV is doing that better than anything else right now because you have a deeper connection to characters, um, and it's why people are so excited about the work that's going on in TV at the moment. Rich. Fuck. Hey, Julia. How Peter? Hey, Rich. Um, so there's a lot of chatter in the industry that kind of ties to what you started off telling Julia about the, all these new virtual MVPDs, these YouTube TVs, which Susan, I'm sure, is going to talk about tonight, and Hulu Live, that they're making up for a good chunk of the gap. Maybe not all of it, but a good chunk of the decline or acceleration in cord cutting is really more like cord shaving to these smaller bundles. But I'm wondering on what's actually, what are people doing? So. I think the average household still watches four and a half or five hours of TV when they have a Comcast or Charter subscription. When they have a YouTube TV or a Hulu Live subscription, how much, live, how much TV is actually being consumed? Like when it's an app on a TV sitting next to Netflix and sitting next to Amazon and all the other things like Twitch, do you watch less total television? Um, I'll give you two pieces of data. One, one is a, a Hulu data, which I believe is about 30 hours as well. So I think it's exactly the same as a Nielsen household in terms of people on um, Hulu Live, how much TV they're watching. Um, and I think that YouTube last week um, told me, and Susan could give you a more accurate number, 80% of YouTube um, TV is actually being watched live, um, which I think they were astounded by, um, and as are we. And it's massive sports, huge news, um, you know, and, and even the entertainment shows are majority being watched live. So FX, you know, which in a Nielsen household I think is watched about 20% live, I think on YouTube TV is watched about 50% live. So, so I, the mix I, of what's being watched is actually pretty different, right? Like you're actually watching, you're saying more live sports than you would watch on. But I don't know, I don't know the, I don't know if it's different. I'm just, I was surprised that it wasn't more on demand on YouTube. I don't know that number on Hulu because I haven't asked. Um, and I actually don't know the number in a Nielsen household. I think it's about 80% in a Nielsen household. I think it is about 80%. And then just a quick follow up. You mentioned Hulu being increasingly important. I'm just wondering. How important is Hulu as a buyer of Fox TV, and do you think it'll be ultimately a buyer of Fox movie content as well? Um, it's a very important buyer of Fox TV. Um, FX has an output deal with, with Hulu. Um, when we've taken things into the marketplace, um, we've sold things to um, Amazon, we've sold a couple of things to Netflix, you know, I think we've sold the majority of things to Hulu because they've been willing to pay the most. So the marketplace is working and they've been very important to us. Um, would they be in the movie business? I think all of the um, streaming services seem to, seem to be desirous of being in the movie business. Lucas. Lucas. Uh, Given the inexorable decline in TV ratings and the growing competition from online outlets that either don't have ads or don't really pay your companies like Fox or Disney a lot of money, how does a media company capture a larger share of the advertising dollars that are out there right now? How is there growth left in that business? Sure. Um, I didn't quite understand the first part, but I got the second part. Um, I think it's fundamentally that the best way to sell a piece of product is still a TV ad. Like if you look at any metric of how you get an emotional connection to a brand or a product, TV kills anything else. You know, you have 15 or 30 seconds of full screen, full audio. What we don't have in the television business right now is targeting. So Facebook and Google are cleaning our clocks because they have targeting. I don't think the product as an advertising product is as good. And I think what you'll see is that all TV will ultimately become IP delivered. And therefore, every piece of TV will be able to have targeted advertising. I think you'll see much lower ad loads. And I think the, the value will go to all three participants. So I think it will flow to media companies. I think it will flow to, um, to viewers who won't have to sit through 20 minutes of ads, because who wants to do that? 
and it'll flow to brands who actually can now target and deliver a great piece of um, advertising. And we see this at Hulu um, through the, the ARPU of Hulu in the, um, in the ad, the people who buy ad, you can have two things at Hulu. You can buy out the ads for $11.99 or you can have an ad load for $7.99. We make more money on the people who have advertising because of the targeting. You know, it's always sold out. It's a fantastic ad platform. Um, and I think as more of the companies, as the distributors come together with um, the content owners, I think there's tremendous value to be, to be had in that. So I, do, I think there's, there's really huge growth um, that you just see through GDP. You know, you'll see $200 billion in this country will grow to 220, 240, 250. And I think TV can return to taking a bigger um, slice of that. So you think- That's my thesis. You think TV is gonna take back share from digital? Over time, yeah, because I think ultimately, it's a real, you know, viewing of audio, view, audio visual viewing of television and placing ads in them is the best way to sell product. And I think what we don't have is targeting and delivery of that. So I think that over time, that's a better product, and therefore I think it will take back share. Amazing, so it'll be interesting to see what Susan Rajiski has to say and, about that. Later. And ultimately, all TV is live and all TV is local. Like if you're in this hotel and you're watching I Love Lucy, you know, you're alive and you're in Huntington Beach, you know, at six o'clock on a, on a Monday, on a Tuesday night, Monday night. Monday night.